Hello and welcome to Women in Antiquity. For each of our class meetings, I'm going to have a short lecture that primarily will be background information for the period in question, since we're not necessarily assuming that everyone has the same kind of background in history. So this will give you some uh, foundation for looking at the materials for the actual topics and uh, hopefully some basis for making some observations about what's going on in each of the different times and places that we'll be visiting. One of the problems that we have, of course, with the ancient world, uh, and it's no different whether we're talking about politics or religion or you know, sociology or uh, gender, is that the information that we have is uh, spotty and inconsistent, and what we have to do is look very carefully at what we do have and come to our own conclusions about what they mean and what we can say about them. Um, some of what we have is uh, not merely documentary evidence, but also images that uh, commemorate uh, individuals and groups and families. And so we can look at an individual like this, for uh, example, uh, a, uh, a work like this, which is a relief that was found in an ancient Roman sarcophagus. And uh, we can see some things about what uh, normal uh, expectations were of members of an individual family. We can look at the uh, individuals here and see a, a young man at the center of the family group who is, uh, you know, whose uh, whose strength and and vitality is on display, um, and uh, he is entirely unencumbered by his clothing. Uh, then we look at the older gentleman, the father, who is wearing a traditional Roman toga that leaves his right hand free. Uh, and then the women are dressed in uh, traditional formal female dress of the aristocracy um, that tends to uh, bundle up uh, their right hand in a way that is not true of the male. Um, and yet uh, the women in this image are also uh, standing side by side with the men uh, and each of them has the same kind of sober and serious expression, uh, whether you're looking at the male or the female. All of these images convey a kind of responsibility and a kind of serious dedication um, to family and, uh, and everything that that entails. Um, and so, you know, as you look at the kinds of images and the kinds of um, things that we're able to see from the ancient world, uh, you don't want to get locked into assuming that each one is representative or um, that it uh, tells the entire story. Each one tells an individual story, and those stories... Uh, accumulate uh, and uh, to, you know collectively help us to gain a better understanding. Uh, both of these frescoes come from the ruins of Pompeii, uh, and so one of them shows a um, a mature couple, both of whom uh, uh, bear you know instruments uh, uh, that um, indicate their standing in society. The male has a rolled up piece of, uh, of parchment or um, uh, some other writing form that uh, indicates that he is uh, an administrator, uh, probably a civic official. Uh, the woman also bears uh, writing instruments, a, um, uh, a set of wax tablets that can be easily uh, wiped and reused. And, you know, this is suggestive of the management of a large household. Um, both of them have, again, the same kind of um, expression of, um, you know, serious uh, uh, formal responsibility. And alongside this, we have a portrait of a young girl who is able to convey a sort of thoughtful and, uh, and you know, whimsical, carefree demeanor. Um, uh, another category that uh, we have in terms of women of the ancient world is the epitaph. 
And so you can look at the epitaph as being representative of the kind of information we have about women in antiquity, but not necessarily representative of the entire story. Each epitaph uh, tells us about an individual, and our ability to extrapolate from that is limited and, and collective. Um, so, for example, we see this epitaph to Claudia that comes from the 2nd century BCE, uh, and we see the kinds of things that she is praised for. Uh, one of the things that you can say about uh, these kinds of um, praise, um, you know, uh, uh, compliments uh, uh, in an epitaph is that they um, lead into some kinds of social expectations of the time and place that they come from. And so you would expect an epitaph like this that praises a woman of the Roman Republic to exemplify the kinds of things that were expected of a woman of that place and time and class. And so when it says that she was pleasant to talk with, she walked with grace, she bore two sons, one of whom left, uh, she left on the earth, the other beneath it. She loved her husband, she kept house and she worked wool. All of these things are part of what would have been laudable about a matron of the Roman Republic. Uh, sometimes um, the, uh, um, what is uh, praiseable is expressed more briefly, and the ones that uh, you know, tend to jump out at us is, uh, uh, are the ones that we are looking for. So, you know, for a modern eye, our, our eye leaps to, uh, you know, worker in wool as a representative of the kind of labor that was required of women. And uh, this, uh, you know, would hint to some as being representative of an imbalance uh, in uh, male-female relationships. But A, work and wool is only one of the things that is being represented here, and uh, as well as characteristics that are, um, you know, that are to be expected of a time and place and class. Uh, and B, uh, the assumption is that uh, you know only women are involved in the kind of labor that is required to run a society. One of the things that we have to be very careful of is uh, modern anachronistic uh, interpretations of the past. And this is something that we have to bear in mind. We need to come to gender in antiquity on its own terms and understand uh, how women of Rome, Greece, Egypt, Sumer, Babylon, related to their own societies and judge each culture um, and understand them and relate to them according to their own um, rules and ethics. Because, of course, they know nothing of ours. Uh, we have um, the occasional mention in, in plays and dramas, poetry. Uh, this varies from time to time and place to place. Um, uh, uh, drama uh, tends to relate to matters of public concern, uh, which men tend to be involved in in the ancient world, and we'll talk more about that in a moment. But this means that um, women are, are less prominently featured in some kinds of drama. Um, what we'll find is that um, women who do appear in drama are acceptable in ways that uh, give us a great deal of insight. Um, they are exceptional in um, the kinds of rules that they break uh, that are involved in drama. Women like Antigone and Clytemnestra that appear in Greek tragedies um, tell us a great deal about the, uh, the gender situation in ancient Athens. So, for example, we have this uh, fragment from Euripides from a play that no longer exists um, that talks about um, both the, uh, um, the praiseworthiness of women uh, as a gender collectively, their involvement um, in, in uh, the home and in society, their role in religion, 
uh, and the fact that uh, for some in uh, the community that Euripides is in, in 5th century Athens, women have a bad reputation, which is undeserved and has more to do in many ways with men and, you know, their expression of their um, role in society than it has to do with women. On the other hand, there's a great deal of, um, you know, straightforward um, blame and criticism of women collectively uh, as, you know, there is in any time and place for that matter. Um, but uh, because the voice of women themselves is relatively muted, most of the literature that we have, the vast majority of the literature that we have from the ancient world comes from a very small number of people, men of leisure, men who are um, of the upper class and wealthy enough and have enough time and inclination to indulge in, um, in interactive relationship with uh, literature and culture to, um, to write, to perform, to create. Uh, and uh, so this is something that uh, comes from the upper class male in any society for the, for the most part. Uh, we do have uh, stray information from uh, from further down in the class hierarchy, and we do have works of art that are created by women as well as works of art that are sympathetic to women. But the point of view that we have and the written evidence that we uh, that has come down to us from the ancient world is uh, is decidedly skewed. And so, this is a problem for the course in general. This is something that uh, all of us have to, to bear in mind with all the material that we're looking at in the semester, is that the evidence that we have and our understanding of each of these times and places is, is much more subjective, much more skewed and, and interpretive than in any other kind of history. Um, because the evidence that we have is so spotty and that the nature of that evidence um, is not uh, representative of, of both genders of all classes and so forth. Uh, and so as we're looking at, uh, we, at, our, um, at what we have from the ancient world, we need to look at how it relates to contemporary expectations of behavior as it involves expectations of gender. And bear in mind that uh, there are expectations of male behavior as well as expectations of female behavior. Expectations of gender roles are, um, are, are conforming in both directions. Uh, expectations of behavior in terms of class um, as applied to gender as well as everything else. The upper class male, upper class female uh, is in a different situation, has uh, different expectations than, than uh, you know, the, the, the peasant farming male and female or the slave male and female um, or, you know, the, uh, the resident alien. Uh, male and female. Uh, it matters uh, uh, very much where you are uh, and in what time. Um, it also, um, the evidence that we have has not all come down to us. It has not all survived uh, for natural reasons because the material that uh, things are written down on in the ancient world, um, unless it's uh, inscribed in stone or, or, uh, or brass or um, is, uh, is buried in a perfectly dry climate, uh, most of that has long since wasted away. Um, and so the, uh, um, and, and the corollary to that is that for evidence to have come down to us, it needed to have been copied over by uh, somebody in the intervening time. And the, the tricky part of this is that the intervening time between the ancient world and the modern world is the Middle Ages. And in the Mediterranean world, um, literacy and the, uh, the control of information in the Middle Ages is in the hands of religious officials 
both in the Christian West and the Islamic East. And so what is selected for transmission, um, for survival, is chosen according to um, the needs, desires, rules, and taboos of the church. And so um, some material that might have come down to us was not uh, copied over and preserved in the Middle Ages and is lost to us. Um, the evidence that we have is, uh, is skewed according to point of view. Nothing is ever written for no reason. Everything that was ever written down was written down in order to express a point of view, in order to convince a reader of something. Um, and uh, then, you know, uh, the, it's chosen for preservation according to whatever um, the, uh, the whims are of the people that, uh, that are the caretakers of the material that they have, as well as the uh, vicissitudes of nature. Uh, and then finally, as I mentioned, uh, even the evidence that's come down to us perfectly preserved uh, is, uh, is warped by our own expectations, um, our own desire to uh, see um, the suppression and oppression of, uh, of women in the past so that we can praise ourselves for having become more enlightened. But the fact is that modern expectations of um, female participation in society um, have to do with modern society, have to do with um, a, um, a demand for female participation in the public sphere, which is a modern phenomenon. It is post uh, Renaissance, it is post-enlightenment, uh, and is extremely anachronistic for the ancient world. Um, the ancient world, in general, this is one of the few things that I believe you can say about all of the very different ancient cultures and, and periods that we're going to be looking at. Um, the ancient world, in general, expects that men will take care of the public and women will take care of the private, and these are equally important responsibilities for the preservation, cultivation, and advancement of a community. Likewise, um, ancient societies tend to assume that men are responsible for the present, for maintaining uh, the city and uh, and protecting its lands and so forth, and that women are responsible for the future, for um, the creation of the next generation, but also the creation not just biologically, um, but intellectually, culturally, and socially, for the transmission of social norms within the family from one generation to the next. And once again, the responsibility for the present and the future are balanced and complementary responsibilities between the genders. Um, the third uh, you know, vector that we need to bear in mind as we pursue this course is the relationship between the mortal and the divine. Uh, one of the kinds of stories that we have from the ancient world is the stories that are told about male and female goddesses. Um, and so there's an extent to which we can talk about um, how male and female goddesses are portrayed differently, but there is uh, only a, a limited um, uh, way of doing this. And the reason for this is, is, uh, um, is quite simple. Um, the ancient world tends to view the divine gods and goddesses as being um, that which is not human, the other. The divine represents um, the, the characteristics that humans do not have and cannot have, um, being immortal. And they represent the characteristics that, uh, that men and women in, in communities and civilizations have rejected. Uh, um, lack of order, uh, lack of morality. 
the uh, association with with uh, with the divine between mortals and the divine is the divide between that which is mortal and that which is immortal, that which is moral, that which lives in a society that is governed by rules uh, and 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 laws and and ethics, uh, the strictures that bind us to think of the community ahead of ourselves, so that the community can do that which individuals cannot. As opposed to the divine, which is uh, is is chaotic, is is identified with the wild, is identified with being unbound morally in the same way that they're unbound mortally. And so we'll be looking at uh, gods and goddesses uh, in the stories that are told about them. Um, and we'll be looking at the reasons these stories are told and looking at them for what they can tell us about the people that are telling the stories and their social expectations. All right, so um, in the course of, uh, of uh, today, uh, you will need to want to make sure that you've taken a look at the syllabus and the schedule, uh, the handouts for the writing assi uh, assignments, uh, and the requirements for all essays. And there's also a pamphlet on, on a, how to approach a position paper. And uh, this is also useful for the other writing assignments as well. But uh, the position paper uh, pamphlet uh, gives you some suggestions for the, uh, the thinking about uh, structuring and pursuing an argument in a paper. Uh, I said that nothing is ever written for no reason because when uh, documents are created, you are always trying to convince a reader, an audience, of what it is that you believe. And this is especially true in, in writing assignments for this class, for any other history class. What you're writing is going to be not a simple summation of the facts because um, our, our information is so subjective that that's actually impossible. What you are engaged in is interpretation, and so what you're going to need to do is to make an argument, a strong argument that is supported by the evidence that we have. We'll talk more about that later as the semester proceeds. Um, so let's talk about evidence, the kinds of evidence that we have. There's basically uh, two major kinds of, of evidence, well, three really, uh, the um, um, the first is is material evidence, that is to say, uh, uh, archaeology and uh, and um, you know various kinds of relics that we have from ancient civilizations. So you know the architecture and uh, you know everything from tools to coins to clothing to um, to uh, grave goods. Uh, the second kind of evidence that we have is uh, is written documentary evidence, uh, which um, is subject to all the problems of survival and, every, and, and bias that we've already talked about. And the third kind of, of transmission of, of historical information is oral history. Uh, oral history comes into play in uh, a couple of major ways in, um, in ancient history. Uh, in particular, there is a period of time after the fall of Troy and the collapse of the Bronze Age in which the Greeks lose their capacity to write. Um, they lose their, uh, their writing system um, as their society breaks down into a more, uh, you know, temporarily into a subsistence agriculture. And so there's a period of about 450 years before they acquire a new writing system in which the Greeks transmit their, um, their cultural information entirely orally. And one of the products of this is the epic poetry uh, in which the story of the, the Battle of Troy, the Trojan War, survives, the Iliad and the Odyssey. And what's interesting about this is that so this information survives through oral transmission, through the uh, the development of people whose 
um, whose role in society is to be a bard, to be masters of these stories, and to pass on this mastery to apprentices that become new masters. And for generation after generation, for hundreds of years, there are these storytellers that are preserving um, these memories of the past. Uh, one of the things about this is that, um, that the stories tend to be preserved but reshaped around the um, uh, around what the audience is able to understand um, and so as a result we have uh, for example these these epic poems of the Trojan War that talk about events from 400 years before they were written down um, but uh, that also tell us about the society and the uh, social expectations of the time in which they were written 400 years later. So um, uh, documentary evidence uh, especially, um, written documents come as uh, three kinds of, three levels of, of reliability. Primary sources, secondary sources, and tertiary sources. So primary sources is uh, direct evidence, is, is eyewitness testimony. It's something that it comes directly from the time and place that it's about uh, and is, uh, is, um, is a direct product of that, uh, that moment and that people. Secondary evidence is evidence that comes from uh, scholars analyzing primary evidence analyzing and interpreting and drawing conclusions. And so if a scholar writes a book about, uh, you know, about uh, uh, classical Athens, that scholar is going to assemble all of the primary source evidence, and that's going to be um, documents, uh, it's going to be um, plays and poetry, it's going to be you know, archaeology and epitaphs and inscriptions. It's going to be all these kinds of things, all of the primary source evidence that's available. And the scholar then interprets it and, uh, and says what he or she thinks is true about this time and place. It adds a level of interpretation. It adds a level of, of distortion. It moves further away from um, that which is that time and place. And then there's tertiary evidence, which is uh, uh, textbooks, encyclopedias, most of the stuff that's on the internet. Uh, tertiary evidence is collecting up uh, um, uh, secondary sources, uh, collecting up uh, uh, expert opinions, uh, and, uh, and, and boiling them down, come, drawing a consensus, averaging them out. And so this is even a further level of distortion as you get more and more um, uh, distant. Uh, and that's, this is why uh, you can't use tertiary sources at all for, uh, uh, for historical papers because tertiary sources are simply too many layers of distortion away from, away from the original moment. For the papers that you write for this class, you'll, you'll need to use exclusively primary and secondary sources. Uh, so primary sources seem like uh, the ideal way to you know, know something about the past, but of course there are problems with primary sources. Um, uh, and so the first of these is the fact that when somebody is recording information, they're doing it for a purpose. Um, they want to convince you of something, and that means they're going to be, um, they're going to carefully choose what it is the th <clears throat> what it is that they share with you. Not only that, there's something called unintentional bias, which is which has to do with how we think, the society in which we're raised, the furniture of our mind. So you know, a, a you know, an American is going to look at a particular event in a different way from you know, a Chinese person or a German person or a Nigerian person 
um, a person from New York is going to look at it a different way from a Californian or a person from New Jersey. A person from 2014 is going to look at it in a different way from 2000, somebody from 2004 or somebody from 1904 or somebody from 1704. Um, and the information that they're able to relay, the eyewitness testimony, is going to be a function of what it is that they actually know, um, even physically where they actually were, what it is that they actually saw. And so if you have an account of, say, uh, you know, a battle, you know, or, or some kind of event, the way in which somebody describes that battle is going to be extremely dependent on where they were actually standing and what they actually saw. Uh, survival, we've already talked about, the extent to which uh, you know, pri uh, only some of the primary sources have come down to us. Uh, the other thing to bear in mind is that everything that we look at in this course is going to be translated from some other language. English didn't exist 2,000, 3,000, 4,000 years ago. Uh, and so the translator ends up making decisions about, uh, you know, how to translate things, what words to choose, what idioms to choose, what phrasing to choose. Um, English is a different kind of language from many other kinds of languages. It has a much um, broader range of synonyms and has a um, rules about, you know, things like word order and idiom and, um, and hierarchies of, of uh, you know, formal and informal speech and so forth that are quite different from, um, from other languages, including ancient languages. Uh, you know, so for example, the, um, um, uh, Jesus Christ spoke in ancient Aramaic, which is a, a language with, with a much narrower vocabulary. And so the way in which Jesus told his stories um, almost had to be by uh, the metaphor of the parable because figures of speech were, um, you know, much less, um, you know, much less fertile in Aramaic. And then on top of that, we have these as filtered through the Greek in which the New Testament was written, a Greek, a very different language from Aramaic, an entirely different language family. Um, and then on top of that, we're reading it in English, uh, a very different language from the Greek. Uh, and so we have uh, um, the fundamental principle that when we look at written evidence, it needs to be looked at not for what it says, but for what it means. We cannot, we simply cannot take any written evidence from any period in history at its face value because any written evidence is going to have intentional and unintentional bias on top of all the other um, problems that we have. Um, and then for the ancient world, it's, it's even worse. And so everything that you look at has to be unpacked. Everything that you look at, whether it's primary source evidence or secondary source evidence, um, whether it's a, whether it's a, an ancient text or a modern interpretation of it, you have to unpack it. You have to look at what the author is trying to convince you of. Uh, and so we have this. One of my favorite quotes here is from uh, William of Baskerville, from Umberto Eco's *Name of the Rose*. Uh, and um, the what makes this quote perfect is that uh, on top of its aptness for what we're discussing here. Uh, Umberto Eco originally said this in Italian, and so what we have here is an English version of the sentiment that Umberto Eco was originally trying to convey. So, for example, um, in, uh, in 79 CE, uh, Pliny the Younger wrote an account of the eruption of Mount Vesuvius, um, the volcano that uh, lies near Naples in Italy. And this account is very useful to us because it contains the actual story of the event um, in, in great detail. Uh, Pliny the Younger is on the scene. He's in a boat in the harbor. Um, and so this tells us a great deal about this day and this moment and so forth. Uh, and, and it also tells us a great deal about the, um, the time and place that this comes from. In other words, 
it tells us about um, you know well-to-do um, you know villas and villages in the time of the first century of the Roman Empire. But nothing is ever written for no reason. Pliny the Younger wrote this to his friend Tacitus in order to praise the um, the heroism and and uh, and and noble death of his uncle Pliny the Elder, who had rushed into um, the villages at the foot of Mount Vesuvius in order to attempt to evacuate and rescue as many people as he possibly could, before eventually succumbing to the fumes. Uh, and uh, and dying in the midst of this cataclysm. And so Pliny the Younger is writing this document in order to lionize, in order to praise uh, Pliny the Elder. And so um, it is inherently skewed, it is inherently biased, it is a, like all written documents, it is a work of propaganda. So does that mean that it is useless, that it is invalid, that we have to throw it away? No, of course not. It means that we need to um, look at this document in terms of what the author is trying to convince us of and uh, use it accordingly. So the information that it gives us about the eruption of a volcano and what it's like to be present in its presence and the, you know, the, the taste of the air, the roiling of the seas, and the information that it gives us about these, um, um, these towns and villages in the, in, the, um, in the Roman Italy of the first century CE, uh, um, all of that is relatively innocuous. Uh, but as we get closer to the thing that, that Pliny the Younger is trying to, to convince us of, the character of the hero of this story, um, then we need to be um, more um, circumspect. Um, then we need to try to um, collate this, uh, this document with other information that we have about Pliny the Elder uh, and, um, and take this information um, as little at face value as possible. Um, we need to understand and interpret the evidence we have according to what it is that the author is trying to convince us of. And you must do that with everything that you ever read, not just the stuff for this course, not just the, um, the excerpts from ancient documents, not just the articles that we're going to be look at, looking at from scholars that are our secondary sources. You need to do this for everything that you ever read from now on. What is the author trying to convince me of? And understand that thing accordingly. Uh, the other thing I need to give you in terms of background is a little bit about uh, how um, historians work with history. Uh, one of the things uh, that uh, is included in this is periodization, which is the tendency of historians to divide history into chunks and sort of characterize those chunks. Uh, it should probably occur to you immediately that this is also a process that ha has inherent flaws because you're going to end up starting to generalize and say that, you know, everybody across this entire period, uh, within this entire time, has the characteristics that are being assigned to it in sort of these bullet points. Uh, and, uh, and so you have to, to come to history and say, you know, the classical period and, you know, the dark age and so forth and so on. Uh, with these, uh, with these, uh, the, the flaws in periodization very much in mind. Nonetheless, uh, we do it anyway. So history itself is divided into four great eras. Uh, the first of these is prehistory, which is a little bit of a misnomer because uh, the um, the turning point for prehistory is the invention of writing uh, around five thousand years ago, three thousand BCE. Uh, and so this sort of assumes that um, this is a very old-fashioned approach, uh, that uh, history starts with the written word, which of course is not true. Human, humans have, you know, uh, uh, hundreds of millions of years of history on this planet. Um, but um, uh, nonetheless, uh, this is the, uh, the chunking of history that we're stuck with. Uh, the other thing about uh, you know this, the invention of writing, fortunately, is that that moment around 3000 BCE 
um, coincides with the invention of civilization itself. Our first civilizations in the Mediterranean world come around 3000 BCE in, uh, in Sumer, uh, in, in Mesopotamia, and in Egypt. And so uh, writing is one of these things that ends up being tied to civilization. Um, civilization is invented. It is a social structure. And gender roles are invented with it. Uh, and so, you know, as we look at, at gender in the ancient world, we have to look at uh, how and why civilization is invented. Civilization is invented because the alternative, people fending for themselves or in small groups, doesn't get us very far. It gets you survival to the end of the day if you're lucky. Civilization is invented in order to create a stable present and the possibility of planning for a prosperous future. Um, and uh, the key to this is, uh, is a number of things. But uh, the, the era in which civilization is invented and perfected is, is what we call the ancient era. Uh, and this is uh, one of the things that, that trends during this, that sort of builds up to a climax, is the development not just of civilization but of empire. And so the ancient era, um, you know, sort of conventionally ends with the fall of Rome and the Western Roman Empire in uh, the 5th century CE. After that, we get the medieval era, which is characterized by the control of religious institutions over society uh, in Europe and uh, Southwest Asia and North Africa. Uh, and uh, this comes to an end with uh, a number of things that break the hold of religious institutions over the masses and creates um, the modern era of, 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 of masses taking responsibility for, uh, for civilization and culture. Um, the period in which we live today. Um, alongside all this, these eras of history are basically social, the way, uh, characterizing the way in which communities relate and individuals relate to each other. Um, in addition, archaeologists uh, tend to talk about um, uh, ages of technology, um, the, the tools and, and engineering that is available to people of, of certain times. And so... The prehistoric era corresponds to what we call the Stone Age. Uh, the, the, Greek for that, the Greek for stone is lithos, and so Paleolithic Old Stone Age and Neolithic New Stone Age, um, the period in which um, people are, have the tools that are readily available in nature around them. And so this is you know, stone and wood, and so forth and so on. Uh, uh, the difference between the Paleolithic, Paleolithic and the Neolithic is that during the Neolithic, people are starting to experiment with agriculture. We see the, um, the, the story, the long story of the agricultural revolution. Um, agriculture is what makes civilization possible. Uh, exchanging a hunter-gatherer means of, of, of sustenance for... Um, uh, literally planting yourself in your in your community in one place and 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 harvesting a a you know domesticated crop from the ground as well as um, a as well as the accompanying you know pastoral um, domestication of animals. Uh, but the agricultural revolution is not just enough. You know, you can't just have agriculture. What's really needed for civilization? One of the reasons that it takes so long is that you need to be able to produce enough food to, um, to feed people that are not farming so that some people in society can do something else besides farm, um, can, um, be, then can specialize in certain kinds of tasks and certain, certain kinds of skilled labor. Um, and this makes possible... Um, key things like uh, like uh, uh, blacksmithing uh, that makes it possible to develop um, the Bronze Age and then the Iron Age, the ability to to forge tools for um, for uh, for agriculture and also for um, you know for war and defense. 
Um, during the Bronze Age, uh, we start with copper and move on to bronze. And then in the Iron Age, uh, transition to iron, uh, which is more plentiful. Uh, iron ore is more plentiful than the materials in bronze. And so, therefore, in the Iron Age, um, the, uh, the benefits of being able to, um, to have metal tools as well as metal weapons is spread out to a much larger um, segment of society and to a much larger number of societies. One of the things that you also want to bear in mind as uh, background for um, talking about ancient history is that we tend to talk about centuries. Right now we're living in a 21st century and it's 2014. And so you can get right away from that that um, the way that we count things in, uh, in the common era, um, the, the secular term for that is the common era or CE, the Christian version is Anno Domini or AD. Historians tend to use uh, uh, CE because not everybody is a Christian. Um, but it's still the Christian calendar. We're stuck with that. Uh, but uh, so the first hundred years is the first century. So year one, year 10, year 20, year 99 is the first century. Year 100 is the last year of the first century. And then you get the second century, the third century. Um, and the, so you can look at it if you want to look at it this way. It's the number of the century comes from that last year. The second century is the one that ends uh, um, 200 years after the beginning of the calendar. Uh, and so forth. By the way, if it bothers you that it's uh, the Christian calendar, you can just bear in mind the fact that uh, Jesus of Nazareth was actually born in the year 6 BCE, uh, and so the whole thing is wrong anyway. Um, but uh, for the ancient era, almost all of what we're going to be studying comes from before the beginning of the Christian calendar, from before the birth of Jesus of Nazareth. And so these are the years that are referred to as BCE, or in, in the Christian version, BC, before Christ. And the years count backwards, as you can see. The centuries also count backwards. And so when we're talking about the third century, BCE, that's the period that runs from 300 to 200, or rather from 300, uh, for rather from you know 201, from 300 to 201. So this is something that you want to bear in mind. The numbers count backwards in in, in BCE, and uh, the centuries do as well. So I'll occasionally refer to something as being either from the fifth century. Or from the you know from the four hundreds or from the year, you know four hundred and fifty. So you just have to bear in mind that from the four hundreds is the same thing as from the fifth century. Uh, we're going to be looking at Greek and Roman history as well, uh, in, uh, a little bit more intensely than some of our uh, other areas of the ancient world. Partly because the Pomeroy book that we're going to be looking at. Is, uh, is primarily focused with, uh, concerned with Greek and Roman history. So um, Greek history comes with, uh, um, with its own periodization. Um, the, the, uh, the, the period of the Trojan War and uh, all the people associated with that, uh, you know, Agamemnon and, uh, and Odysseus and so forth, all of that comes from the end of the Bronze Age, the period of the Mycenaeans in ancient Greece. And we'll talk about this later, but um, the Bronze Age ends very dramatically. The entire Bronze Age economy in the Mediterranean world collapses all at once around 1100 BCE. And uh, we come to, uh, uh, as I mentioned before, the... Um, um, Greek society falls back on a very simple agricultural economy at first. Um, they flee the cities and, uh, and spread out across the countryside. And all of Greek society is reorganized around uh, farming villages um, that gradually develop a new culture. 
Uh, this is called the Greek Dark Age because it's dark to us. We have no writing from this period, and so, uh, and not a lot in the way of archaeological information either. Uh, from these uh, widely dispersed, uh, uh, you know, farming communities in the ancient uh, Greek world. But it's during the, the Greek Dark Age that the foundations for the Greek society that we're familiar with are laid. And once the Greeks acquire a new writing system in the 8th century, um, we move into a period that's, that's visible to us. First, the Archaic period, um, and then the classical era, the, the, uh, the era of greatest cultural ferment, um, the area in which uh, the, the Greece that we tend to picture is, uh, is formed. Um, this lasts until um, the Greeks are, uh, are conquered in turn by the Macedonians, uh, led by First, uh, um, Philip II, and then Alexander the Great. Alexander the Great is a great admirer of the Greeks, and he uh, absorbs uh, Greek culture and spreads it out to the east, um, to, uh, um, to, um, uh, to Mesopotamia and Persia and Egypt and all of the, all of the eastern world. The entire Eastern Mediterranean world and Southeast Asia and 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 Egypt, um, everything to the east becomes connected and and linked together by the um, by the the ideas of Greek culture and by the Greek language and Greek expectations of society. This is called the Hellenistic period, the period in which um, these Hellenistic societies, societies imbued by by Greek culture and ideas fused to um, the ancient cultures of, of Babylon and Egypt. Um, this new synthesized culture, this new Greekified culture, um, becomes the, the, uh, the, the predominant culture of the ancient world, and the, uh, the Romans enter into that as well. Uh, the Romans, speaking of which, uh, emerge later um, there's a, the Romans don't emerge until after the Bronze Age has collapsed, uh, and uh, they, um, um, they, their earliest period is a period in which they're ruled by kings, but the Romans uh, reject the idea of kings and the idea of one person being more important than everyone else. Um, for a period of 500 years, they have this society that is ruled over by um, a, collect, a large collection of, of noble families uh, uh, who all, um, you know, uh, struggle to, to preserve the idea that no one person should be more important than everyone else. And so it's during the Republic, this sort of collective governing of Rome, uh, that, uh, that we find Rome's greatest accomplishments. Um, it's during the Republic that Rome defeats its greatest enemies and builds um, the, the great majority of its empire. It's during the Republic that Rome comes to dominate the entire Mediterranean world. Uh, the last holdout is uh, in the Mediterranean world is Egypt, uh, ruled at the end by the last of the pharaohs, Cleopatra the seventh, the famous Cleopatra, uh, and uh, and and Egypt is finally absorbed. Uh, Cleopatra defeated, humiliated, and forced into suicide at the very end of the Republic. One of the last great events of the Republic um, in uh, in 31 BCE, and from this point we have a period in which. Uh, um, what we call emperors, the the princeps, the first um, the first man in Rome, uh, is uh, is ruling over these vast dominions that Rome had already carved out for itself. Um, the The period of emperors lasts for about five hundred years as well in the West um, before before uh, the city of Rome is taken by barbarians. But by the time that happens, Rome has created a second capital, which is even more vibrant and thriving in the East. And uh, the Roman Empire in the East, in Constantinople, continues to endure for another thousand years. 
So the Romans, uh, as we'll discover, have their own ideas about society, their own ideas about gender, uh, and it's uh, one of the most fascinating things about uh, the story that we're going to be looking at is is the interplay that uh, between you know Roman tradition and uh, the societies that they are forced to encounter and, and uh, contend with as they move out into the world, uh, and the, um, um, the, the, the interplay between Roman ideas and Greek ideas of society, gender, community, religion, and all these other things. Uh, so um, this is all I have for today. Um, please make sure that you look over all of the handouts. Please make sure that you have signed up for a presentation. Uh, this is very important. Uh, and please uh, email me with any questions. You, there's, a, there's a link to my email uh, on the, uh, on the, on the uh, left-hand uh, panel in Blackboard, and there's also a questions forum where you can post questions for me uh, to answer or to be discussed with the rest of the class. Um, but, uh, you know, there's a great deal to do uh, in this course. Uh, there's a, you know, we're, we're looking at a lot of things and we're, you know, we're doing a bunch of different, you know, different kinds of writing assignments and so forth. Um, there's a fair amount of work and it's, and it's important to bear in mind that it's compressed into a narrow period. Um, I'm hoping that you won't be intimidated by that and that you, you know, you'll rise to the challenge and, um, and do so, you know, in as interactive a way as, as possible, um, given the technology that we have. Go into the forums not just to respond to the readings, but to talk about the, the, the problems and, and ideas that they've raised with, uh, with the other students and with me, and, uh, because what comes out of discussion is, is understanding. Um, and, uh, and so I'm hoping that you'll, that you will uh, take advantage of, of all that this course has to offer. And, uh, we'll see you again on day two.